say anything yeah. more about it? So yeah, thank you for joining us today, Brian. Brian is a, a representative from the Humane Society. He's going to be talking about the organization, uh, volunteer opportunities, and uh, culture of the organization as a whole. Uh, Brian, I, I made you a co-host for the event, so feel free if you want to share your screens or um, take any questions. I'm here to help you facilitate or anything like that. Okay, great. I don't really have anything to be sharing with the organization, or sharing with the group, the group, because we do have so many different programs that uh, that we have available for people to be volunteering to. And so to try to have you know, presentations or anything like that would be, um, there'd be a lot of different areas you need to go to. The best thing to talk about is just that our website is uh, very detailed in these different programs. So if you'd like to find out more about one of our programs, I can be, I would be happy to direct you to that part of the website. And we can, you know, as we're going through the Q and A, if we want to you know, share a screen or whatever, we can share some content on our on the website to show, you know, the different areas that the Human Society of the United States participates in. So to start out with, uh, the Human Society of the United States is a nationwide organization that focuses on fighting the big fights. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, are aware of your local nonprofit animal rescues, the ones that take in the dog and cats. Those are your local humane societies. We are a national organization that while we do have many shelter partners across the United States, and that's your local you know, ASPCA or you know, your local SPCA or the Humane Society of you know, whatever county, uh, there are shelter partners and we work with them when we have local issues that are going on or when we have issues that are going on across the state or across the country where we need to have a large number of animals being brought in such as the case when we have puppy mills or large-scale animal cruelty investigations. Uh, as I said, the Humane Society of the United States focuses on the big fights, the puppy mill fights, the fights towards legislation for protecting animals, the fights against uh, factory farming, the, facts against, the fights against dog racing. Uh, here in the state of Florida, uh, just last year, we had a, I'm sorry, just uh, 2018, we had a tremendous victory against dog racing. Uh, the state of Florida, has the largest number of dog tracks in the entire country. There were uh, 16 out of 20 tracks, I'm sorry, yeah, 16 out of 20 tracks that were operating in the country were here in the state of Florida. And Amendment 13 was on the ballot in uh, 2018 and the state of Florida passed that amendment by 69% banning the largest chunk of dog racing in the entire country. And that comes to pass here at the end of this year, all dog racing will be illegal in the state of Florida. And so uh, because of the COVID-19 crisis, many of these dog tracks are closing early. And in, in fact, as soon as Amendment 13 had passed, a few of the dog tracks decided to close at that time. So there's a phase out period where all of these dogs will have opportunities to be rescued. Uh, none of the dogs are going to be destroyed, despite what our opposition was claiming that thousands of greyhounds will be killed because of the, the tracks closing. All of these dogs are being rescued. All the dogs are being placed into adoptive homes across the country. And so their, their biggest claim didn't sway the voters and, and will never come to pass because of the, the number of rescue groups that exist across the country. Uh, but that's just one example of the numerous victories that the Humane Society of the United States has had in terms of fighting for the welfare of animals. Uh, we also fight for uh, to stop large scale killing events. These are events that um, where basically the hunters are going out and being paid on a per animal basis that they go out and kill. These are not uh, hunts that are being done for sustainability where the people are eating the meat or they're being done as a form of population control or as some form of um, you know, trying to reduce numbers and, and balance a population or protect an endangered species. These are strictly sports that are killing for fun. And we've had numerous exposés that are really starting to get some good traction across the United States in protecting wildlife and exposing these events because many times they occur in the middle of nowhere or for the justification that says, oh, well, we have to protect our wildlife, we have to protect our farm animals. And so these predator killing events are absolutely un unquestionably cruel because there's no reason to go out and kill as many wolves as possible in the dead of winter when these animals are already fighting for survival. And yet this is exactly one of the events that occurs in Minnesota every year as a, you know, one example of how we do, you know, our, our many, many ways of protecting you know, different forms of animals. So the Humane Society of the United States has numerous opportunities where we need volunteers. 
Um, and this is what I'd, I'm very happy to be able to spend some time talking to you about. And we can talk about the specific functions that you'd like um, once we get to you know the, the end of my pre what I wanted to talk about. So we have what we call district leaders. And this is where, this is what I like to spend a lot of our time focusing in. Um, because this is where we have the most impact. Uh, throughout the country, we have different volunteers who are decided that they want to spend a significant amount of time volunteering to help pass laws that will protect animals, uh, like Amendment 13, or like laws that are going to be banning uh, puppy mills. And for those of you who don't know what puppy mills are, uh, puppy mills are large scale breeding operations whose only function is to produce dogs or cats or other animals for the retail sale of, of the animals throughout the country. Uh, currently, only Petland is the only national chain that continues to sell dogs and cats. So your pet smarts, your pet supermarkets, pet co's, and numerous local pet stores have stopped selling dogs and cats because that is a losing business model. And it supports the very cruel industry of, of puppy mills. And if anyone's ever seen these exposés and they're available on our website on humanesociety.org slash stop puppy mills, that you can see these undercover videos and the pictures of the animals that have been rescued for it. But it's, it's a condition that no one would keep their dog or cat in who claims to love animals. You would not keep a breeding mother in basically a wire cage for her entire life, continually impregnating her to just basically sell off her, her puppies year after year, cycle after cycle, all for the sake of basically profit. So that's what we try to fight. And we fight that through, we fight that through fighting the, by banning the retail sale of dogs and cats. If it wasn't for the, the, the individual pet stores or the pet land stores that exist across the country, there would be no puppy mills because no reputable breeder would ever sell their dogs to a pet store. They wanna see the, where the dogs are going because they have that connection with the breeding, the breeding parents. And usually it's people will sell them to your friends or, or whatever. Those are not the industries that we are worried about, those people who are breeding those animals. The puppy mills are where the large scale animal cruelty is going on. And so that's why we go after the public face of it, and that is these pet stores. And so what we've done is across the country, and we've been successful in more than 300 communities across the United States, and more than 80 of those are here in the state of Florida, that we've enacted retail sale pet bans. What that does is says that no store in the, in the county or in the city that we pass these bans in or in certain cases, there's two states that have passed it, uh, California and New Jersey have banned the retail sale at the state level, that no store can sell these animals. They can't sell dogs and cats from, from the stores. They can open their spaces to adoption programs, such as what you'll see in Petco's or pet, land, pet supermarkets, uh, where they have an entire wall of you know, adoptable animals, or they'll have adoption days where these rescue groups come in. And so this, that is exactly the model that we wanna see. We wanna see you selling collars, dog foods, bowls, toys, treats, costumes, whatever, just don't sell the live animals because those animals inevitably come from these puppy mills. And so what we have is we have what's called district leaders and we split the country up into your, your federal state, I mean, sorry, your federal representative district. Uh, give you all a little bit of quick civics lesson. Every state has two senators in the Congress. We also have your representatives are split up by your state population. So a representative could represent say Volusia County and Seminole County and part of Orange County. Another representative will, will, will support St. Petersburg. Another one will be in the Tampa area. There'll be a different representation from the Tallahassee area. So those are your federal representative districts. And that's where we let people, that's where we have people focusing is we ask our most active volunteers in those areas to be district leaders and that's it's a volunteer position and what the people do is you form a relationship with your representative so i'll use our representative as an example uh, her name is stephanie murphy she actually just recently um the last not the last cycle but the cycle before that she upset a very long-term incumbent and took over and since then she has been a very proactive person for the animal issues that we've been brought before her uh, the Humane Society of the United States publishes something called the Humane Scorecard, and that's where we go through and we rate each senator and representative on how they voted on the animal issues, whether it's issues relating to shark finning or transport of animals across state lines for the purpose of hunting, uh, greyhound racing, uh, whatever the different animal related issue is. If the bill came before the body, 
then we try to rate them as far as how they did. Uh, Stephanie Murphy actually has an A, an A rating. She has been very active in supporting all of our issues, as well as actually um, speaking on the floor on behalf of the animal issue that is being brought forward for. Uh, we're working on her, working with her to get her to have an A plus because we like to see her be much more effective on it. Uh, unfortunately, there are some representatives that have a zero rating because they have been you know, for whatever reason, they are, are opposed to these issues and everything in between. And so when we do talk about the district leaders, you are, are in your, in your uh, federal district and you build that relationship, but you also work with the communities within your district. So for example, in our district, we have Seminole County, we have Volusia County, uh, we have parts of Orange County. And so my wife and I work with Seminole County to pass one of these retail pet sales bans. And we were very successful in it. It was in uh, 2018 that we passed the retail pet sales ban here in, in Seminole County. And we also had to go to some of the individual cities because some cities may have their own local laws, like the city of Sanford. And for, if, if anyone's familiar with the Seminole County area, uh, Sanford is, is just one city within Seminole County, one of our larger cities. Uh, they have their own animal ordinances. So we went to them and said, hey, this is what we have in Seminole County. We would like you to adopt a companion bill. And they accepted that bill and they now have that as part of their legislation as well. So that's what our district leader program is, is it's our hardcore activists that are going to work towards passing laws and building a relationship with your senator so that we can have the strongest federal laws possible. And so in addition to these uh, district leader positions, we also have what we call allies, district allies. And if an area already has a district leader where we have a very active either group or a group or a couple or sometimes it's even you know, a, a, a two people who are unrelated could be you know, doing that type of thing, but you want to be involved in your area, then we would have you be a district ally. And what, what your job would basically be is to help out the district leader so that they can be more effective. So if we need to have phone calls to be made to a representative, if we need to have actions being done against the city commission, or we need to have people come forward to speak at a commission meeting, that you'd be an ally and we could trust that you would be there to be joining and helping out the issue, helping out on the issue. So that's just one of the many volunteer opportunities we have with the Humane Society of the United States. Uh, one of the other one we have, and um, this is very good timing because right now we have a, a tropical storm out there in the Atlantic, is we have what's called the DART team, D-A-R-T. It's Disaster Action Response Team. And these, te these groups are very active whenever a disaster occurs. Uh, here in Florida, we have the hurricanes. Out west, they had the fires that were occurring. Uh, we've had flooding incidences that have occurred where we need to have a group of volunteers that we can count on to be trained, and that's, that's the important thing, and to be available to come out and help whenever a disaster occurs. Now, earlier I had mentioned our, our shelter partners, and those are your local humane societies, your animal controls, that basically handle the day-to-day -day operations of rescuing animals in your community. They take the dogs and cats that are found abandoned, or the dogs or cats that people can no longer care for, and they have to turn them into a responsible organization to adopt these animals out. Your local humane society, if they're a shelter partner, we know that we can lean on them in times of disaster to take animals from another area that is having a disaster so that our local facilities can then focus on our disasters. So when a hurricane comes along and hits say the Panhandle or hits Tampa, we know that we can ask an organization down in South Florida to take as many animals as possible so that we can clean out these shelters because we know that as soon as this disaster passes, numerous animals are gonna wind up homeless. The people wind up having, when your house gets destroyed, you obviously have an option to go stay somewhere else. If you had to, because of your current situations, you couldn't take the animals with you or an animal has escaped from your house because you tried to shelter in place and you had damage to your house, the animals got out, you know to go look at your local shelter. But if the shelter already is at max capacity, then obviously this is going to be a, a situation where the animals can't be helped as much. So that's where we really lean on our shelter programs. And the DART program comes in after these disasters. So after the hurricane has cleared, the waters have receded, and the safety administrators have chosen to say that the area is safe, the DART teams come in and they go into the different communities that have been impacted and they try to help people collect the, you know, find any animals that have become stranded, they have become separated from their guardians, and they're just running at large, and then try to reunite them with their current guardians or take them to the shelter of record 
so that when the people do return, they know where to go look for these animals. And that's where our shelter partners play such a key role. They have the facilities, they have the staff to care for these animals. So our DART team can continue to focus on going out into the communities, helping out and making the most dramatic change we can for these animals that are currently running, you know, unfortunately, and not, not at their own choice or discretion. It's not like they just ran away from the, the people who were caring for them. They had you know, they were part of the disaster too. And so our DART team is also incredibly effective. And that's another area where we need individuals to be able to come in and help out when we need these animals to be rescued and saved. And the reason why I say trained is because we can't just take anybody and everybody off of the street to do this kind of thing. Otherwise you have, you know, for those of you who have ever seen a dog running into traffic, you know what happens when you, a stranger is approaching a dog that's already at a very heightened stress state. And so we want to make sure that people are trained so that they know how to approach animals so the animal doesn't further injure themselves or so that the animal doesn't run into an area that's even more hazardous for their care, for their situation. How to properly handle animals that are stressed or injured, how to properly take the animals, put them into a confined area such as a carrier or a truck, and then transport them to these rescued areas. So there are numerous other opportunities and we have about 25 minutes left in the, or about 30 minutes left. So I'd like to ask you guys, what would y'all like to focus on? What other issues of either animal welfare or what we call the big fights that the Humane Society is capable of engaging in? Because we do have the resources and the volunteer base and the experience in engaging in these fights. Whether it's animals that are being used for fur, uh, animals in the food industry, or animals that are being used for exploitation in circuses or in um, entertainment, such as the gambling on, dog hound, on greyhound racing or in the, the larger fights that many of y'all may not even be aware of that have gone on in the past. Uh, there was a time where dog fighting was actually legal in the United States. And now all 50 states have banned dog fighting and cop fighting. That's where they have uh, roosters basically fighting other roosters to the death. Um, those things are banned nationwide. And that was one of the largest victories of the Humane Society of the United States is to pass these animal fighting laws because it is absolutely inexcusable to take an animal and exploit its natural behaviors for the sake of entertainment and profit, especially to the injury or death of the animal. And so we fought long and hard to end these types of things. And there were a few states that were very hesitant to end these types of, of behaviors. And unfortunately, many of these fighting events still go on you know, underground. Uh, one of the largest ones and the most public ones was obviously the Michael Vick case. I'm sure we all remember when Michael Vick got you know, basically banned from being part of the NFL because he was involved in the dog fighting business that he, you know, what his participation level was, was very, being very active and involved. Uh, we, he actually, after he realized what he was do doing these dogs and had several meetings with uh, you know, the upper group of the Humane Society of the United States, he actually became a spokesperson against dog fighting. And so Michael Vick was very influential in communities that the Humane Society may not have been, may not have been available to go into. You know, many people who are big NFL fans would listen to Michael Vick more than they would listen to you know, Wayne Pacelli of the Humane Society of the United States or Kitty Block of the Humane Society of the United States. She's our current, um, our current president. And so where she may not have that same kind of reach, Michael Vick could go into those communities and people would listen to him because they respected him. So I'd like to take the, the, the next half hour. And, and again, I apologize for cutting, cutting into your time too much with being called into work. Um, but I'd like to take the rest of the time to talk about what issues do y'all want to learn about? Where would you like to go with, with you know, where the Humane Society focuses on? Uh, I can talk more about puppy mills. Uh, we can talk about legislation, the legislation that passed last year. We can talk about some of the other fights or any animal issue that you care significantly about. If you care about animals that are being killed for food production or animals that are being utilized in, in circuses or animals that are being, um, used in the horse racing trade or, I mean, sorry, the, the horse racing, the horse racing base, business. I would be happy to talk to you about any of these aspects of, you know, the often hidden abuses to the animals and to tell you how, how we help these particular issues and where you can go to, to look for these resources available to you. So if you want to, um, and I'm not sure how, if everyone is muted, if you can, can they unmute their own line, Emilio? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, feel free to unmute okay. yourself. Uh, if you feel more comfortable adding it to the chat box, please do so. But you could take off your video or just take off your uh, or 
turn on your audio and video, uh, whichever you feel more comfortable with. But, um, you know, this is a chance to really let Brian guide the conversation based on your interest in the trends in the industry. So are you guys doing anything about um, whaling? So whaling is a huge issue that unfortunately the whaling is controlled by the international there's an international body the international ii the international whaling association and unfortunately this is a much larger battle than what the humane society can be taking on because i know our our companion organization hsi humane society international does have a focus on on whaling. Uh, currently, there's only two countries that are engaging in whaling, and that's Norway and Japan. They're still the only, um, and to, to some degree, uh, Russia is, but Russia is not as prolific in public about their, their whaling. Um, Norway and, and Japan are the only two organizations that continue to have whaling vessels operating and are basically snubbing the international law on it. Um, they are doing it under the guise of research. And in fact, if you've ever seen um, there was a TV show called Whale Wars a few years ago. I don't know if any of y'all are, are aware of it. Um, but that was where Sea Shepherd is the organization that is the primary, um, the primary organization that is organizing and, and focusing people's battles on changing the laws for whales and trying to expose this. Um, they'll paint these big giant words, research across the side of the whaling vessels. And they're doing it under a, a clause within the, the, the international uh, the initial treaty that was signed to end whaling, there's still a certain amount of research is allowed to be done. And unfortunately, that includes the taking of whales. Um, so they're doing another guise of research. Uh, HSI, Humane Society International, which is hsi.org, has a really great section on whaling where they talk about what can be done towards that. Um, a lot of it is exposing the hypocrisy of research whaling and then selling whale meat. So that's what goes on in Japan and Norway. Um, selling dolphin meat and whale meat. Actually, uh, Japan is also a big consumer of uh, dolphins, both for the entertainment industries, such as you know, SeaWorld and Marine Land and those, those marine parks, but they also do sell the meat of the dolphins to the consumers in Japan. Uh, so you may say we, HSI is our, our companion organization that focuses on that because it is an international issue. Uh, you may say the United States obviously focuses more on, on, on our local issues. Uh, what we do in terms of trying to help out with the whaling issues or the dolphin issues is we do oppose marine parks. Uh, there's a section in our website that talks about dolphinariums and performing animals and how we are opposing those or those either new openings or expanding the current uh, animal exhibits at those marine parks through our partnerships with those very same organizations. Um, SeaWorld has been... Uh, has taken positions that have been very positive towards other issues, such as shark finning or the uh, the rampant hunting of sharks for killing them to just um, cut off their fins, which is used in Asian delicacies. So, when the marine it, the marine performing industry was opposing that, they were obviously a partner with us. Uh, at other times, because we have built relationships with them, we are on opposite sides of the issue because they're supporting something. You know, this is. This is their business model, and we are, we have to ask them to say, "Hey, don't open up a new you know, performing dolphin pool, or retire the dolphins that you have, or you know, release the injured dolphins that you have to a more natural environment, either a seaside sanctuary, or you know, some other way for for these animals to be cared for." So I, I know that was a little bit of a long answer for it's HSI that focuses on that, but to, did that answer your question satisfactory? Yes, it did. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So any, yeah. any other questions that someone would like to, you know, whether it's companion animals or exotic animals, um, non-lethal predator control, there's so many different ways that, that anim, you know, we can coexist with animals that are not our dogs and cats. Uh, you know, so many of us do have you know, bird feeders, animal feeders outside. Um, unfortunately, some people use those very same animal feeders that instead of enjoying wildlife, they use them as attractants to create a hunting situation for animals. 
Um, and so that was one of those, the, um, the wildlife culling events that I talked about. There's actually a, and, and this is a disgusting thing, it's called a squirrel slam that used to occur. Um, it was up, up in one of the Northern states where they would literally go out and take squirrels and you could kill as many of them as you could. And unfortunately, people were literally slamming squirrels. They would attract them to these feeders and they would be sitting behind a, you know, some form of camouflage. And when the squirrel walked up and was distracted by the, the feeding, if they couldn't shoot, if they weren't shooting the squirrels, they would literally reach out and slam, you know, grab the squirrel or the animal and slam it to the ground. And it was actually that very action that brought attention to the issues that, that occurred. Uh, as I was saying about puppy mills, for so long, the public was unaware of how dogs and cats are being raised. And I don't know how many of y'all here were, were aware of puppy mills. Um, and I, uh, somebody just put something in the, in the chat here. Hold on one second. I don't... Um, How are you guys helping, uh, helping animals that are going extinct? Or so animals that are going in, going extinct. That is a great question, and it's uh, yes, we do. We do focus on animals that are going ex extinct, especially where the actions that are resulting in the animals going extinct are preventable actions. Um, I will use the state of Florida as an example. There is down in South Florida, there is um, a deer. A, a subspecies of deer called the key deer. And I don't know if anyone has ever seen pictures of them. They are about the size of a small dog. They are a very petite animal. And you may say the United States is constantly working um, and are, um, back up a little here. Uh, you may say the United States has, in addition to our volunteer crew, we also have a number of, of paid individuals who are employed by the Humane Society of the United States. And they're called state directors. and. I think we have a majority of the United States are covered by directors. There's a few states that we currently have openings that we're looking to get filled, or we have people who are uh, representing multiple states. But here in Florida, we have uh, Kate McFall is our state director, and she is a, a great advocate for the animals here locally. She has numerous connections in Tallahassee, where she works with our legislators to help ensure that protections that are being offered to these animals continue to stay and advance. And she's also worked with FWC the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, which is the organization responsible for protecting wildlife in the state of Florida. So to protect animals that are going extinct, you have to protect not just their habitat, I mean, not just their lives of the animals that are living right now, you also need to protect their habitats. So in the case of the key deer, uh, the Humane Society of the United States was very active in protecting areas down in the Florida Keys, which if anyone has ever been down there, you know that it's a it's a great place to vacation. It can be terribly expensive to live down there or to, to stay down there at the hotels and things. And so the real estate is very valuable. But these key deer, these very small deer, they live just in Deer Key, which is, I, I, I know, it, it sounds very dumb to be saying these things, but Deer Key is where the floor, where the key deer live, because that's, that's the habitat that is best suited for their survival. So creating these wildlife sanctuaries and then protecting the wildlife sanctuaries is something that Humane Society of the United States does focus on. And some of the bills that we do rate our representatives on are how they voted on these, these bills, which would threaten species that are becoming extinct or becoming endangered. Um, when there is going to be an expansion to drilling or mining or logging, those are things that are going to threaten species. And we have used the Endangered Species Act as a justification for why these these wild areas need to be protected, why these species need to have these areas to live in. Um, so that, that's a great question. And yes, we absolutely do. Uh, we also partner with numerous other organizations to protect animals. Uh, for example, here in the state of Florida, there is unfortunately a continual and ongoing fight for manatees. I don't know everyone, and I'm not going to speak on behalf of everyone, but probably most of us have either seen or know what a manatee is, the, you know, the, the large gray, somewhat blobby animals that, that live in the, the, the rivers and streams and springs of the state of Florida. So these animals are under constant threat because of the loss of habitat, because of boats, because of the red tide that occurred a few years ago. Um, they're not hunted because there's no 
real thrill in hunting a manatee. I mean, they, you know, they, they move about two miles a day. So there's really no thrill in hunting a manatee, but they do get injured. They, they suffer from cold stress. They are mammals. So they need to have warm water access during the colder, well, colder in Florida. Um, during the colder months, they need to have access to the, um, to the warmer areas of water around uh, certain power plants or the natural springs, but they also need seagrass to be grazing on. And so it's this loss of seagrass that is so important because when they build marinas or when they build housing developments that have docks, they could strip out giant areas of seagrass. And that loss of seagrass, that loss of vegetation that these animals need to eat and survive, this is the kind of thing that the Humane Society will partner with an organization called Save the Manatee Club. We also partner with Defenders of Wildlife, as well as um, the Florida, Florida Springs Association, as well as numerous clean water organizations to help out the manatees because they need to have, as I said, you can't just protect the lives of the animals. They also need somewhere to live. They need something to eat. They need to be able to have natural wild spaces and they need to be able to travel through those natural and wild spaces. Um, Wildlife corridors are, are going to be huge in the news for the next few years as we talk about expanded roadways and how we need to make sure we, we maintain wildlife corridors so these animals can migrate around so that they don't wind up having more endangered and threatened animals. Uh, we need to have our waterways keep open, keep be open. We need to have manatee zones so manatees aren't being threatened. So the answer is yes, we do. But we also do focus with other organizations to be a much stronger voice for the animals. And that's where it does help to have a good volunteer base because in a lot of the cases, you know somebody who knows somebody who's involved with these groups. You know, not everyone can be an expert in everything. I, you know, I know a little bit about the Florida aquifer, but I can't tell you a lot about it. Whereas a clean water advocate could talk up, you know, could take this entire hour and talk to you about the different things that are good about Florida aquifer and why we want to protect it. So and, and these are great questions. There is, there is no wrong question. And I am not, I am not above saying, I don't know, but I will be happy to email, e email Emilio the answer or the link to, to an answer to your question. So if you think it's some question that you're, you, know, you don't want to ask publicly, you want to put it in the chat, um, please feel free to you know, send Emilio an email and you'll be happy to pass it on. But I, there are no wrong questions. This is, and I appreciate you guys taking time out of your day. I know y'all are very busy with school and doing remote schooling is probably a lot more difficult than it is even remote working. So I want to thank y'all so much for taking an opportunity to listen to me talk about an organization that you may not have even heard of. And so I really appreciate y'all taking the time. And any, there's no wrong question. There is no wrong answer. And I'll be happy to answer anything about, you know, maybe, maybe you're not about the organization itself. If you want to know about a particular animal issue, I, I saw animal X, Y, or Z in my backyard. Do you know anything about it? Or could you help us figure out something about it? Um, my neighbor's got a, you know, a dog. He's got you know, cooped up in his backyard. Anything like that. We are happy to help and, and talk to you about that. Um, and how, how you can help it and, and how you can get involved with the Humane Society of the United States to be a stronger voice for these animals. Hi, I had a question. So uh, the hunting action, the hunting actually reminded me. So over the past few, over the past few years with the current administration, over about about a hundred environmental laws and protections have unfortunately um, been um, destroyed to some degree. Some have thankfully been blocked, but a lot of them have not. One being. Um, um, a black bear hunting law where they were like allowed to go open season during hibernation season, which is absolutely barbaric. Um, what does your organization do or what have they done within the past few years to try to counteract these in unfortunate setbacks that our current administration has caused? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, what she what you're talking about, and thank you for that question, um, is prior to the Trump administration, uh, there were the federal law stated that you could not hunt bears while they are in den. Um, in other states, other than the state of Florida, many bears will have to go into uh, caves or you know, wood trees or into areas where they have a protection and they will actually physically hibernate. The, the bears basically go to sleep or when they're having their young, they are in den and they, they live in their dens where they are safe and protected from being hunted and killed. 
which many, many, believe it or not, many hunting groups are opposed to these legislative changes and these actions. They consider it to be cowardly because you're not, there's no sport to killing an animal living in a cage, in a cave, excuse me. So um, when the Trump administration did remove those protections from these animals, we actually went to the individual states and asked that the individual states pass laws, or if we couldn't get them to outright ban this, you know, the, obviously our focus would be to ban the hunting of the bears. Um, bears being an apex species are also very slow breeding. And so any damage that is being done to the bear population puts a tremendous stress on the entire species and moves them closer to threatened and, and, and possibly even extinct species. Uh, so we oppose any type of increased hunting to, to bears specifically, but any large apex animal that is going to be harmed by, by this hunting. So what we'll do is we will approach the states and, and say that your, your federal legislation, you know, the federal laws have changed. We are asking your state body that is involved to either enact laws or enact policies that will protect these animals. Sorry about that, I just sneezed. Um, here in the state of Florida, we actually have been very active against the black bear hunt. Um, the state of Florida has a subspecies of bear that is the Southern black bear. And for those of you who've seen them, they're smaller bears, they, you know, smaller, relatively speaking, you know, these are three or three, four, up to 700 pounds for the males. They're smaller bears and they haven't been hunted for a number of years. And prior to that, there was a few decades. Uh, 2015 was the first year that the Florida, Wish and, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission allowed a hunt of the bears to begin again after it had been banned in the early 70s. Well, it was curtailed in the early 70s. It was outright banned in the early 90s. So for two decades, the bears were protected. No one could hunt them anywhere. It was only when bears were considered nuisance bears that lethal force was ever authorized for these bears. So in 2015, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, FWC, chose to open bear hunting. Well, that created a firestorm that they were never prepared for. Where our, our activist base, as well as numerous other organizations all came out. We had, we had bear warriors, we had um, animal protest organizations, we had wildlife advocates, we even had certain hunting groups coming out to join against having this hunt. And the one year they did have the hunt, it was a complete mess. Um, the number of animals that were killed were shockingly high. The publicity over these animals being hunted at all was incredibly negative against FWC. It was a, it was a preventable fiasco. It was preventable deaths of wildlife. So, but it, it does show one of the actions that we take, and that is that we appealed to FWC both before the hunt and then after the hunt, and every year since then, that hunting black bears in the state of Florida is a bad idea. They're a very treasured species here in the state of Florida in terms of our eco ecotourism, which because of COVID, we don't really have anymore, um, but also in terms of the populations that live in close interactions with these bears. Um, believe it or not, there are communities within the Ocala Forest that have, um, that actually, you know, people live permanently within the Ocala Forest. Um, and so these people know how to live, coexist with bears. They have bear-proof cans, they have bear-proof dumpsters, they have bear-wise communities. And so they know to live, how to live with bears where bears don't become problems that have to be, de have to be destroyed. So it's enacting local legislations, local policies, local group, your, your, your state group can act towards protecting the wildlife when the federal legislation fails us. And, and it has, and in, in even beyond the Trump administration, this isn't, um, animal protection is not a left or right issue. It's a right and wrong issue. That there are as many Republicans as there are Democrats and a few independents in there that will support the animal issues. Uh, as I said, when we did Amendment 13, and that's just the most recent one where we have you know, very high numbers to be pointing to, 69% of the state of Florida voted to ban dog racing in the state of Florida. There are 69% of, of you know, liberals, there are 69% of, of Republicans and conservatives. It's a, you know, animal issues are right and wrong issues. They're not right and left issues. But sometimes when one, one body steps in and makes a bad decision, we have to ask another body to take in and pick up the slack on that. So that's a great question. And that, that does show where 
you need to have flexibility and you need to have presence. And that's why a nationwide organization is necessary to help these animals out. And that's why we need as many volunteers as possible to, to join our fight for, for the animals. So I hope that gave you some, a little bit of an answer and some, some, some more input onto our organization. Yeah, that was great. So how do we get involved with volunteering with these organizations? So our website is hsus.org. And then on our website, there's a, a, um, there's a button that says volunteer. And you can click on the volunteer and what level of volunteer engagement you would like to take part in. Whether you want to just be, you know, just get email alerts, get our, um, our newsletter. And excuse me one second here. Sorry, I had these away from where I was sitting here. Um, our newsletter is called All Animals because that's what the Humane Society of the United States focuses on. Um, this is the Sweet Face of Victory is the, the title of this one, but this is about the puppy mills. And then this is um, Game Changers. And it's where um, this has a good article in it where we talk about how you can protect animals by changing policies from organizations. Um, Eggling and, and um, so you can elect to receive either one of those. You, know, you can elect, just get email alerts, just get our, our publications. But I will be happy to send Emilio a uh, a link that you can click on to get into the the volunteer link, so you can decide how active you want to be. Because we really do need everybody. You know, for some people, they're just you know, some people are just click activists. They have enough time to read an email, understand enough about the issue, look at it, go, oh my god, that's horrible. Click here's how I can help. Some people want to get more involved and pass legislation in their community, and that's great also. And some people want to actually work for the organization. They're willing to devote their time and energy towards an employed position helping animals, and that's great also. So we also have job boards available. So I'll be happy to send Emilio the link that you can follow to decide what engagement you want to take in helping out, you may say, the United States. Um, as far as other organizations, many of them do have you know, their own websites where they have their own engagement. And um, yeah, if, if there's any questions about those specifically, you can send them to Emilio, and I'd be happy to, to share them with you guys also. If we if we have a relationship with them, some we some we just partner with, and we really only have a, a lot of you know, discussion with them on that. That would be great, Brian, and I'll be sure to send that to anyone that attended today, and uh, do a blast out to any students that shown interest in it. Great. But yeah, we need you know we need every voice we have because as I said, this animal. Animal protection is not a left and right issue. Um, it really is just right and wrong. And many times people have to be made aware of the issue to understand why it's wrong. Uh, for example, animals that live on puppy mills. For the longest time, the animal protection organizations were talking about puppy mills, but the general public wasn't aware of them and how, how they are linked to the pet source. And that's when you know, the, the one nationwide organization, Petland, that continues to sell dogs and cats to retail stores, um, they're actually losing shares in the now the pet supply industry chain. Uh, you know, everyone can probably name off four or five Petco's, Pet Smarts, uh, Pet Supermarkets that you have passed or seen. But when you say Petland, many people, oh yeah, we used to have one down over here or down over there. Well, that's because the public opinion has changed against buying dogs and cats. So many people are now adopting from your local shelters, adopting from your local rescue groups, and in fact. PetSmart is one of the largest adopters of animals because they do have their adoption facilities and they partner with the rescue groups nationwide. So we need to have as many people as, in, as possible involved in helping these animals. And so we encourage you to get involved with our email alerts and any other way that you feel that you can help out. Uh, we always love to have letter writers. Uh, letters to the editors are very powerful. And in many cases, some people have said that the top three areas that people read of a newspaper are the front page, the obituaries, and the opinion pages. So I don't know if they read the obituaries second because they want to see if like their enemies have died or if maybe if they want to see if they're dead today. So I don't know. But letters to the editors, the opinion pieces are usually one of the top three places read in a newspaper. And so we always need letter writers to help us with our different campaigns to influence the public view on an issue that is often hidden from the, the abuse is often hidden from the public. So 
So I think we're just about coming up on the out of time. So I want to thank you all again for letting me talk your ear off for about the last 45 minutes about the Humane Society. Um, again, our district leader program is probably one of our strongest uh, features and functions that we want. So if you are interested in that, we I can definitely get you in touch with uh, Kate McFall, our, um, our state director. She is the one who organizes all of our district leaders. And it's a great way to um, to learn about the issues in depth and to be a stronger voice for the animals in your community. Brian, thank you so much for taking the time today and sharing such insights and asking, answering all the questions for our students. Uh, we look forward to getting those links and sharing it and being a proponent of the brand. But uh, thank you again for taking the time today and sharing your insight. Yeah, absolutely. And, and thank you all so much for taking up, taking up your time as well. Awesome, Brian. Thank you students for all attending. And again, uh, any information Brian sends my way, I'll be sure to follow up with you so you have the information in your inbox. Thank you so much. Awesome. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you. Yep, yeah, y'all have a great day too.